take running. I'm up at this job. Let's take a look what kind of job because the cluster is right. It's slow. It's very slow right now. Come on! Are they kidding me? A selective job with a full scan. <laughs> Didn't they take a database lecture? There exists something called an index, even for Hadoop, like the trade index from Hadoop Plus Plus. Come on, that is why the cluster is right very slow right now. Let's skim the job and create a trading index for them. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Come on, guys. You are trying to take down our cluster running full scans over terabytes of data. Even though the job is quite selective, I'm creating a trading index for you. Uh, a trading what? A trading index, index, man. It's a clustering index for each HFS block that allows you to retrieve only relevant records from this. Okay, but you see how long it's taking to create a Trojan index? I think our job would have finished by now. Calm down. I know that the upload phase is relatively long. However, after the index is created, your current job and even future jobs will run like a cheetah. Believe me, just take a look what you can gain. Okay, that looks interesting. Yeah, impressive, but you know, I'm not only interested in this one attribute. I might have queries on other attributes as well. How will your index help me then? Oh. Yeah, in fact, uh... Yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, guys, that, that's exactly the problem with the and indexes, you know, I mean... It, it takes really a long time to, to create that index in the first place. I will stop that job. It's not going to work. It's going to take really much uh, too long. So, uh, this is really what you did in your paper two years ago. And uh, you see the problem here. The standard upload with HTFS takes them about that much time. But if you do your Trojan indexing with all the binary conversion, all the indexing, it really takes a long time. So you better make sure that you uh, have many queries afterwards just to amortize uh, the index creation costs. And that's just, just the first problem. The second problem is that uh, the index only works for one of the filter attributes. If you have another uh, attribute you're interested in, the index is not going to work. So why don't you guys just sit down because I have another idea to explain to you that maybe that will solve both problems. And this idea is called HAIL, which stands for Hadoop Aggressive Indexing Library. And it works as follows. So let's look back first at the standard Hadoop. So what is the standard Hadoop doing? It's two things, right? It's HTTPS and MapReduce. So how does it work? The first thing Bob was doing, what we saw at the beginning is, he takes his text file and uploads it uh, to HTTPS. So he uploads his terabyte-sized file. And what HTTPS is, HTTPS is doing, it partitions the file into horizontal partitions. Those horizontal partitions are called HTFS blocks. And they're rather big. It's not like a database page with 8K or something. This is 64 megabytes at least. Often it's way bigger, like half a gigabyte or so. HTFS um, partitions the data and distributes it over the cluster, which means each horizontal partition is stored three times on different data nodes. So those are different machines sitting on that cluster. And we do that for every partition, we create three replicas until we're done. And this has a nice property that is very important in such a cluster, that is failover. So assume that two nodes fail, like data node 2 and data node 5, and you want to retrieve... Um, oh, there's this echo. echo. Uh, if you want to retrieve um, HTTPS blocks 3, HTTPS block 3, so you already lost two of them, but you still have the option to go to data node 6. There's still one copy available, so it's all fine. So what about MapReduce then? So when Bob wants to use MapReduce, he needs another software layer that's operating on top of HTFS. So Bob will send his map function to MapReduce. And what MapReduce is doing is it will assign a separate thread on each of the data nodes having some data. So um, these threads have a special name, they're called mappers, and each mapper reads one of the HTFS blocks as input, breaks the HTFS block into records, and for each record, the map function is going to be called. The output of those map calls is then stored locally on this, on the different data nodes. So from reading this HTFS block 6, we obtain 6 prime as the output from the map function. And we do that for every block. Of course, we do not have to do that for every replica, just for one of the replicas for each block, for one of the copies, we have to do that, and then we are done. 
Afterwards, of course, there are other phases in MapReduce, like the shuffle phase and the reduce phase, but they don't matter for this paper. This paper is just about the map, uh, the, the map phase and the initial data access, which is super important for many applications. So, what is HAIL about? HAIL is very similar, so it's almost the same, except that we take HDFS and we changed it a little bit uh, to do some better things. So how does it work? In uh, HAIL, the user also uploads the data initially to be able to use MapReduce. We also partition it into blocks as before. There's no change whatsoever. We also distribute it over the cluster as before. But then something important happens here because before writing it to the different data nodes locally, we sort the data. We sort it uh, inside each block. And what, what we also do, and that's very important, is remember we have those three copies for each block. So we have here a copy for block one in three different places. We sort these copies along different criteria. So one copy is sorted along attribute A, the other along B, the other along C. So what, the, what this means is, after sorting, we have the same block with the same logical data available in three physical layouts which is, of course, very nice for query processing. Yeah, we do that for each and every block until all of the data has been processed. And then we are done. So what about failover? Of course, that's super important in the cluster. <coughs> so failover is untouched. As in our previous method, we had a related method to Trojan layouts and socket theory last year um, that has the same property. We don't uh, mess around with failover. Here again, if two data nodes fail, like data nodes 2 and 5, we can still retrieve block 3 from data node 6. Maybe it has the wrong sort order. Yeah? So we can't use the index in that case, but then we have to scan. So we are back to uh, standard Hadoop business here. Okay, so there's a lot of details involved in that. Um, so just some interesting details. I mean, it's not just about the different data nodes. There's also a so-called client that's used for uploading and there's a name node. And maybe the most important things here to learn are what we do in the beginning is we, we scan the data, pass the textual data into a binary representation and use a text layout which uh, is very efficient. But again, remember we don't use a pure column layout. This is just reorganizing data inside the HDFS block. Uh, the Hay client then sends the text blocks uh, to the different data nodes. The data nodes uh, apply the different sort orders and write the data back to disk. In addition to that, we had to be very careful to not break the checksumming mechanism. So HDFS is very strong when it comes to fault tolerance and uh, correction codes. There are different levels of that and we didn't break any of that. We had we to uh, integrate it in a way that it works. And the other important thing, of course, is a name node. The name node is a central directory. So in standard Hadoop, it allows you to look up the places where the uh, blocks sit. We had to extend that a little bit to also keep the information, okay, which sort order is available on which of the data nodes. That's very important for query processing. For query processing, um, there are also a lot of details here, but it boils down to the question, okay, how do you teach MapReduce to exploit those different sort orders? And there are basically two ways. The one is to change the input to a uh, the, uh, the map signature, we have like a getter and setter method, so one might think about Avro style access here. And the second is, uh, what, that's what we did, is we used an annotation. So uh, you can't really read that here, but uh, on top of the map function, you annotate the projection and the filter condition, and with that, we can exploit it and do better query processing. Well, let's look at some experimental results. Uh, the first thing we did was upload times, and it's clear. We do way much more work than standard Hadoop is doing. In addition to Hadoop, we do passing, we do conversion to the binary layout, we do three sorts. This is super expensive, right? So we did an experiment and just uploaded data, switching off sort, just doing binary conversion and the conversion to packs, and that's what we um, obtained. So this is standard Hadoop just doing the, up to, uh, the upload to HDFS. This is our old Hadoop plus plus, uh, doing upload plus uh, the conversion to binary, and this is hail. So it turns out this is faster, even though, even though we do um, more work. This obviously doesn't make sense, right? But then we thought about it a little bit, and well, the point here is, this file went past to binary, 
is smaller. Yeah? So the texture representation is larger, but the binary representation, as it is smaller, we do less I.O., we spend less time, and that's what that's why we gain here. So it really has a lot to do with the uh, relative sizes here. If, this, if the binary representation is uh, bigger, of course, then we are a little slower than the original. But then, okay, let's see if we switch on indexing. Now let's make the CPU really work, CPUs really work. So we scale in the number of indexes. One means one of the data nodes is indexing only, the others are not. And there you will see a huge increase in the two plus plus because we have to do this map reduce job, we have to run this map reduce job, whereas in our method, well, it's a little more expensive, but not so much. So let's continue, continue, it's still very good. And at this point in time, we were asking, okay, asking ourselves, okay, what the heck, I mean, sometimes you have a situation that you have a lot of space available. Using three replicas is just the default. That's it, how HDMS is shipped, but we don't have to live with that. We can use more replica, replicas if space allows for that. And that's what we did. So we increase the number of replicas, and if you, we have like six, seven, eight replicas, this means for Hale we have six, seven, eight clustered indexes on different sort of that's what this experiment shows. So this is standard to do, standard only upload to HDFS, no indexes whatsoever, default replication. And if we scale, we see even for six clustered indexes in Hale, we are slightly faster than the standard um, um, Hadoop. So you learn that for some data sets, at least there are others where this doesn't hold, but for this data set, it, it, it holds that you can get indexing for free. Yeah, we also did some scale-out experiments, so we played with larger clusters on EC2, they gave us a very nice donation, we got uh, up to 100 nodes. Um, this basically shows that you can do it, upload works well, on, on, even on a large cluster, footnote to Amazon, please fix stability of your virtual nodes. <laughs> it's really, really difficult to get 100 nodes running for a longer period of time, and they keep vanishing, disappearing, breaking all of the time. So this took us quite some attempts to make this work. Anyway, so what about three times? Um, so here we look at the, this is like the academic view, this is basically the I.O. time. So what we did here is we had a um, workload of queries, uh, different attributes, it's very similar to the uh, benchmark published three years ago at Sigma from Stonebaker, this uh, Pablo benchmark. And what we measure here is the record reader time. That is the time that's spent in the record reader uh, scratching the data from disk, basically. That, that's the access time, more or less. That's not totally, totally precise, but more or less that's the time. And it shows that we gain a lot. So whenever we hit an index, it's really great. If you don't hit the index, we still have to scan it, but, but it's all fine. And at this point in time, we could basically stop, send it to be or to be, it would be accepted, that's fine. But uh, then we also took the user perspective that is, okay, I mean, what is the end-to-end -end time? How much would the user gain here anyway? And this is just the academic record reader all time. Interesting, yes. But what's the end-to-end -end time? And there we see, well, what we gain is not so great. Yeah, so what we gain here is um, uh, factor two in performance, even uh, sometimes it's even less compared to Hadoop. Uh, and you see here that, um, uh, well, this is a factor two, but, um, yeah. <laughs> Come on, James. All that, only for improvement factor of two? What is that? Yeah, I know, it's just pretty bad. I mean, we thought about that, the factor two is it's not so great, right? But, but then we did, we did some analysis on that, and it turns out the problem with Hadoop is the scheduling of that. So just to schedule a single map wave, a single map task, it takes like three or four seconds. And if you have an index access in the map task taking 50 milliseconds, you lose. The index doesn't make sense. So Hadoop map reduce was built for large tasks, for slow tasks. There it works pretty well, but if you do this uh, fancy index exercise, it doesn't work. So everything that's wide here is scheduling overhead, which is pretty bad. So we thought about that in order to make Bob happy, and we, we are also proposing a new scheduling technique as part of the paper, which is called Hail Scheduling. So let's look back at Hadoop scheduling first. How does that work? Assume the situation, you have these indexes, and you're want to uh, use a map function and you're interested in the blue sort order. So for the blue sort order, you have to access seven indexes. Yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the blue ones, which means if you do the standard scheduling where one HTTPS block is scheduled with one split and one 
mapper, you will have seven map tasks, and this means you have seven times the scheduling overhead, which means you basically lose. No way. Yeah, it doesn't make too much sense. What we do in hail scheduling is, um, before running the actual job, we um, group all of those uh, interesting HDFS blocks together. Uh, so the uh, interest in the blue sort order, this basically means we use a single map task to bind all of them together into a single split, and hence we only have one uh, scheduling overhead. So you might feel like, okay, this is going to break failover, right? One of the strengths of uh, Hadoop is failover, but here it's not so severe because these, these jobs take just very little time. If anything goes wrong during that time, you just reschedule the whole thing again and you hardly feel it in the framework. So let's look at query times with health scheduling. And here you see, George, that the times are way better. So we're down to 16 seconds. We get an improvement like a factor of 70 or something. Uh, for okay, cool. But as you said, what about the failover? I want to see those numbers. Yeah, we also did an experiment on that, actually. Um, I haven't had a slide on that. So here the idea on that slide was uh, we took a cluster of 10 nodes. We killed one of the nodes in mid-flight. And then we would see what happens. Yeah, as I told you at the beginning, Failover in hail means that maybe we don't have the right sort order for some of the blocks available, which is not so good in terms of performance. But again, we inherit the performance, the failover properties from uh, HTFS and to do MapReduce, and hence uh, we only have a little slowdown. So correct, uh, correctness is never affected at any point here. So maybe you guys want to switch to hail. You're right. I don't know. It's <laughs> so if I were to do a summary of a summary of what this talk is about, I would say this talk is about fast indexing and fast curing at the same time. Thank you for your attention. Considered uh, comparing your work with column stored based Hadoop. I have seen a paper, I think uh, it's a joint work with Washington University and IBM, and they did some column based uh, Hadoop uh, HDFS and they showed really interesting results and order of magnitude and orders of magnitude difference between 
Hadoop and Column Store Hadoop. So, have you ever considered this uh, comparing your work with uh, their work? Okay, I mean, this Column Store stuff is, is a very long story. I'm not, I'm not sure whether you have seen our tutorial yesterday. We did a 90 minute session where like 50 minutes was spent just on this layout and how the Column Store fits into the Hadoop MapReduce layers and the different papers that exist. There are many ways how you can do that. We did it uh, using the column layout inside these huge blocks. And it turns out in many experiments, that's a good rule of thumb to do. Uh, you, can do you can improve in many ways on that, but it's a good rule of thumb. Uh, many experiments go in that direction, saying that that's a wise decision. Question concerning the benchmarks. Then I didn't. Maybe I missed it. But were the Hadoop's run on the text file? Are uh, the Hadoop uh, times from the text reading from the text files or from the binary files? Now we have both of them. Of course, it's interesting to understand that the comparison with the text file is maybe not totally fair. And therefore, we also did it. Uh, the paper shows this number. How much do you spend for the binary? We do that for Hadoop plus plus. Basically, that is. Um, Basically, this number. Yeah, so here you have uh, the do plus plus, it's no index, just the binary conversion, and that's how long it takes if you read it from there. Maybe if you read natively from the binary file with some code filling, you could do that better. But that's the do plus plus without an index, just the binary conversion. That makes sense. And my question on the hail scheduling. So, the, the benefit in, in hail scheduling is that you actually have less members because you combine the splits. How is that actually different from using really big HDFS blocks that just have one network? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Of course, for indexing, I mean, this is an important trade-off. We also had that in our Hadoop Plus Plus paper two, two years ago. For indexing, it's better to have large HDFS blocks. Yeah? When you have fewer indexes, fewer index accesses. So at the time, there was a limit to HDFS. You could only use up to one gigabyte HDFS blocks. I think they're now trying to remove that. But there's a natural balance with failover there. Yeah. Yeah? The less blocks you have, the more you run into the problem, okay, what happens if one of the blocks goes offline? Yeah. But then again, you have to also reschedule the combined method. Can I explain? No. 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 no, no, no. Let me explain that a little bit the explanation as well. In fact, the, also the main difference with the normal uh, HFS block, when you're, or the normal uh, input split, when taking several uh, HFS blocks, in fact, you have to take contiguous HFS blocks. So imagine you have 10 blocks and you want to take only four blocks from there, you have to take block one, block two, block three, and block four. So, and that doesn't mean that those blocks have the right indexing, for example, or the right replicas. And, may, and that doesn't mean that those four blocks are restored on the same node. So in the hair splitting, we're not doing right like, like that. We're just clustering the, uh, the different uh, replicas we have on different nodes, and then even if they are not continuous, we're just grouping together, and that is a new hair input split. It's not the normal one. And that is a big difference here. Yeah. Maybe the second part, second part of the answer to that is um, you don't have to reschedule the entire hair split. It's relatively easy to combine it with a simple logging technique where you uh, keep track on which of those blocks inside the hair split were successfully executed and which were not. We had some related work on that on ICDE last year. It's basically combining the two of them. So, yeah? Uh, yes, I looked all over your website for that logo. Uh, do you have it somewhere? <laughs> oh, for my what? For, 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 for that angry elephant logo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we sell these t-shirts for 50 bucks only, right? <laughs> oh, 50 bucks only. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make a living somewhere. All right, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. There's someone else. Okay, we have time. Yeah. Go ahead. So have you done now uh, both like, you know, workflows, multiple jobs, jobs with map and reduce, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the uh, benefits? Like, you know, clearly the map side benefits, but if you were to look at a larger workflow, how are the benefits translate? Yeah, that's a great question. So, of course, the, my academic way of saying it's always orthogonal, right? That's other guys working on that. So I said it's, it's the map phase, it's the uh, accessing the data. But what you can also do with our stuff is, um, whenever you store an immediate result, you can write it to HTTPS and create three clustered indexes at relatively low cost. So whenever you send data to HDFS, 
or even in situations where you typically would write to local disk, with our system you could consider to write to HTTPS and have three clustered indexes almost for free. That, that's ongoing work, yeah? so I, I don't know what comes out of that, but you can use them there as well. Oh, yeah. I want to ask you the, how to choose the columns to be sorted in uh, replications. So I mean that given the workloads, uh, how to choose the, the sorting order? Yeah, it's yeah, a kind yeah. of uh -huh. deselection problem. So how do, uh -huh. did you choose? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Okay, so I said, okay, I pick these three attributes and they magically fall from the sky, right? I know which are the attributes to create those indexes on. Well, that's of course not true, and that's what he's saying. So how do I pick the indexes in the first place? I have to know the attributes which, for which I want to create the clustered indexes before uploading. Yeah, that's what he's saying. So, um, the one thing is a traditional thing, you use an um, index selection algorithm, and we did also something on that in SOC 2011, where we did something similar for vertical partitions, and that algorithm can actually be extended to also pick these three, uh, um, three sort orders. But of course, this only works if you know the workload. If you don't know the workload, you have to play other tricks, and that's ongoing work. There are other techniques to achieve uh, fault tolerance than trivial replication, for example, read Solomon encoding. Um, uh -huh. how, so in this case, I think you can do one index, but uh, do you see any quick way to uh, get to more than one uh, uh, index with read, read Solomon or other? So read Solomon, you mean like RAID 6 style uh, storage? That's what is used. So basically, you, you use some polynomials to yeah. to be able to recover. Uh, so you don't blow up the data by factor of three, instead you blow it up by a smaller factor, but achieve uh, the same level of fault tolerance, meaning that if you... Uh, if you yeah. the, but, but then uh, the, the data is somewhat transformed by using some algebraic structures, so you don't have this... Uh, uh, nice property that you have in your case that uh, the data yeah. is uh, uh, there is the same data in, th in three places. That's a great, the, absolutely great. So how would you how would you lift how would yeah. you lift this uh, idea of uh, keep keeping the number of indexes the same even yeah. though the the data is uh, transformed algebraically? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think someone should look at that. We didn't do that. We thought a little bit about that, but it would make sense to think about that definitely. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.